And so we are going to get started. Um, thank you so much um, for everyone joining us this afternoon. My name is Casey Foster. He, him, and my pronouns. I'm the co-executive director of Partners for Dignity and Rights. Uh, I am here in on the Lape land um, in, in Brooklyn, New York, and I'll be facilitating the conversation. And hopefully you will hear a little from me because um, I want you to hear a lot um, from our panel um, this afternoon. Um, and so I'll introduce um, our panel. Um, we have uh, Elian Farhat with us from Take Action Minnesota, Tarson Nunez um, from the Observatory of the Metropolis in Porto Alegre in Brazil, and Faduma Fado from People's Economy Lab in Seattle, Washington. All of them uh, are with organizations and movements um, that have been building governing power um, through strategies that are about bringing people in um, from the margins and sharing and distributing power among people in order to build more expansive democracies. And so really happy um, to have each of them here talking about the work that they are seeing, where they are, that they're supporting. Um, you know, I opened talking about being on Lenape land, which I think is critically important to name indigenous spaces, particularly when we're in a conversation talking about governing power and democracy. Um, you know, it was here um, on this land years before any Europeans came and brought settler colonialism that the Iroquois Federation had built and, and nurtured and cultivated um, an expansive democracy that includes much of the governing principles and values um, that these organizations are trying to trying to bring forth. And so it's important to be grounded in our history. Um, it's important to understand our history, uh, to understand what we're building um, for our future. And so with that, um, we're going to jump into the conversation with folks. And we will start um, with our brother, Tarson. Um, so Tarson, thank you for joining us this afternoon. There feels like there's a lot of optimism and energy in Brazil, uh, that there's an opportunity for people pushed to the margins and oppressed by this previous regime, um, that there's a new opportunity um, to help shape democracy and, and the future in Brazil. Can you talk about some of the strategies and models that people are building um, to reshape Brazil's future? Um, and can you talk about the ways in which participatory democracy um, plays a role in that? Thank you, Casey. It's, I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, I'll talk a little about my experience here in Brazil uh, that goes from both sides of these questions because I was... Uh, a member of the unions movements and the students' movements in the, the period of re uh, redemocratization in Brazil in the 80s. And then uh, on the 90s, I was part of the municipal government that the Workers' Party started uh, in Porto Alegre that built participatory budgeting for the first time. So I can see the question from both sides. And I would like to start uh, stating that uh, if you look at all the history, uh, most of all democratic rights that uh, we have uh, today were results of struggles of the people. Democracy was always something that was built from the bottom up and from outside into the state. And this is very important when we talk about how to build a stronger and a more intense democracy, that the main uh, necessity that we have to have a strong democracy is to have strong social movements, uh, a very or, uh, people organized and people pushing for more rights, pushing for more democracy. Uh, in our case, uh, in Brazil, our learning path uh, started in the 80s uh, when we were uh, emerging from a, 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 dictator, a military dictatorship. And when we restored the uh, traditional democracy, elections, liber civil liberties, we started to realize that this was not enough. Only having elections, only having the right to decide who, who will be in the government was not enough to have uh, to establish and to deepen democracy. So uh, we, at that moment, have had strong social movements pushing forward democracy. And this impulse from below made us uh, made us uh, able to build uh, a 
a huge network of participatory institutions here in Brazil. We don't, we don't do not only have uh, participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre and in many other cities, but also a whole uh, network of participatory institu institutions like uh, sectorial councils where discuss to discuss sectorial policy policies like health, culture, urban planning. Uh, a wide range of uh, of spaces to debate, to 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 elaborate, to debate and to implement public policies, and uh, lots of uh, different kinds of legislations that allow people to have a voice uh, on the public policies. But I think that it's important to see that all these uh, uh, achievements were a result of a pressure from outside into the state and from a, an approach that did not limit our action to the institutional level. Uh, we, didn't, uh, we do not only participate in the political system, but we uh, also implant our own initiatives. Like uh, you not, uh, we, we evolved from demanding to the state to uh, participate directly in the decision-making process, but also by doing things uh, independently of the government, like implementing uh, cooperatives, like I think that Paduma will talk about uh, a little more about this later, uh, occupations of land like the MST does to occupation of wastelands, urban occupations to the housing. So I think that it was a combination uh, between direct action and institutional participation. And the and one thing reinforces the other. If you have a strong social movement pushing forward and doing initiatives and building our own institutions and building our own power outside the state, we are stronger to demand and to discuss with the political authorities to, and having a, a stronger position to, to negotiate with the governments. So I think that's the important thing is to break a false dichotomy between uh, what my friend from CUNY, Selena Su, calls invent, invited spaces, the space, the political spaces that the state opens to the social movement to discuss, and invented spaces like build our own political spaces of actions beyond the institutional realm. So I think that this combination between institutional intervention and, uh, and direct action is the most important. And I think that we must rely on our own forces, our own, uh, our own autonomy. This is what's the most important aspect of what we need. Thank you for that, Tarsen. Uh, Elian, I'm gonna turn to you and I'm gonna try to build off um, some of what I heard um, from Tarsen. And, and, and one of that is, you know, thinking about Minnesota, I think um, for people outside of Minnesota, there's been a lot of about the, um, most recent legislative session in Minnesota. Um, a number of substantial, um, even transformative pieces of legislation and bills got passed. Um, but I think Tarson is hitting on some things that, that didn't happen by happenstance, that there's a movement in Minnesota that's been building towards that, towards capturing the type of governing power needed um, to, move, to move and shape policy in the way that we saw this year in Minnesota. Can you share a little bit with us about what has been the kind of long-term strategy in, in Minnesota um, for organized constituents and organizations to capture governing power? Hey, and I, yeah, just Tarsen, I, so much what you're saying was resonating and I feel like it's important to note that many of us in Minnesota are both fans and students of the organizing in Brazil because there's so many lessons to learn that we have worked to bring here into our, our own organizing. And when we're thinking about governing power, collaborative governance, building infrastructure that sort of prefigures how we want the state to operate and like and endless lessons um, from the work in Brazil. So thank you for um, being our teachers in many ways. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it won't come to any surprise to anyone on this call that we didn't get here today in Minnesota overnight. Um, and there's many ways to think about the long arc of what brought us to this legislative session. You can go 10 years ago, you can go 20 years ago, you can go 30 years ago. Um, there's there's ways to tell the story um, over many, many decades of intentional organizing and organization building in the state. 
but all sort of situated sort of in the last decade. Um, but I want to honor and name, I could talk about many decades of, of work that led to this moment we're in today. Um, you know, we, um, the reason that the last decade is important is because prior in um, about 10 years ago, we um, move we our legislature flipped from a legislature that was ready to pass the policies that we were advocating to to one that wouldn't. And we've been in that situation for 10 years and have been really organizing in the state to build the power and capacity we need to flip the Minnesota legislature to one that was ready to act on the policies that we passed this last legislative session. And what's important is that, you know, what it's not, it's not like a straight path to winning. There's actually like many different iterations and shifts and changes and many terrains within which we were organizing and building that got us um, to the moment that we're in today. And I would say there's a, a couple different levels of it. Um, one, I think, is just like being very clear that our North Star as Take Action Minnesota and in the movement we are organizing and building and with is to win governing power. And we understand governing power very simply to be the power to set the agenda in a in a place, whether that is government, whether that's the economy, whether that's your workplace, whether that's your apartment building. Um, and our organization, um, you know, organizes in many, many different spaces, but did a lot of work with thinking about what is the power we need to set the agenda in our in our government and at the state level. I think the other thing I just want to say is sort of framing for then what then we were able to build um, is to understand the state as an arena for contestation and to say that government is not a thing that exists and operates outside of us. It is us. And we and that actually becomes very dangerous when we third party government. And so to take responsibility for our government, for the way it operates, for who is elected to it, who is staffing it, who is running it, and the policies that come out of it. Now, did or any of the recent things what we want? No. But it is like a, a, um, a practice in discipline and, and hope to say, we believe that this can be a government that operates in the interest of the people that is by us and for us and that delivers on the public good and the promise of our state, of our country, of our democracy that most of us have never actually experienced. Um, and so I wanted to ground there because that clarity and orientation on the possibility and potential of what it would mean to govern um, and what it would mean to have governing power is at the center of what then guides and directs our organizing as an organization and with the partners that we build and organize with. Um, and so what got us to today, I would say sort of like focusing on three different areas of organizing, we kept organizing over the last 10 years. We didn't give up um, and we made gains in many places that led us to be able to win big at statewide this last year. One place is at the Capitol, at the state Capitol. We um, we worked um, legislators and labor unions and community organizations worked to establish something called the Minnesota Values Project. That was started by a former Take Action Minnesota staff member who ran for state house out of Duluth, Minnesota, one, got in there and was like, people are not organizing. There's no like agenda. It's not cohesive. She's like, I, I have a vision for how we can organize an agenda across the caucus and with partners that we would then run, that would say, tell Minnesotans what we will do if you elect us, then get elected and pass those policies and really show people how that can work. So building that infrastructure at the state level was really critical, even when we knew we didn't have a hope of getting it through the Senate, that was um, that was said one day we'll be at a place where we can pass it and let's make sure to have that governing infrastructure in place. The second thing is like we passed policy, the House passed policy, even though there wasn't a lot of hope of getting it to the governor's desk for signing. And that helped us build the muscle and the, the, um, the muscle memory, the understanding of how policy moves, the public conversation, um, getting the house actually ready to lead and move and pass policy when that moment came. And so just like really priming the pump on that front was really important 
um, and also showed people that we can keep making progress even though um, we might not get there today. The second arena was in our communities. So when we couldn't win at the state level, we didn't stop. We moved to our cities and our counties and we passed policies there. A great example of this is Earn Sick and Safe Time, which um, we, we ended up passing in four cities before it passed statewide. And that not only built the momentum of this is an inevitable policy that will pass statewide once we get there and really tamp down a lot of our op opposition, it also helped us sharpen the policy, make it more inclusive, um, make it more in line with our values. One important thing is like we expanded the family definition so that many ways people define their family is the definition for how paid sick days are applied in the state of Minnesota. The other piece of that is we figured out how to do enforcement mechanisms that um, that led to more co-governing infrastructure. So really making sure that the enforcement mechanism included re-grants to community organizations to do education and enforcement um, to support our movement and to build that infrastructure in our state. And then the last place that we really focused on in the last 10 years that got us to where we are today is the ballot box. Um, and you know, elections have consequences and we have a diverse movement ecosystem with, um, organizations that work across, you know, have C3s, C4s, PACs, labor unions. Um, and when we think about, you know, what it means to be active at the ballot box, one important piece is making sure that we're doing the leadership development with our people. So that if they choose their path to power in life is, is, is in public office, that they have the skills, the resources, the tools they need to discern that choice, to make that choice, to run for office, and then get connected to other infrastructure um, that can help get them elected. And a really important piece of the legislature this last session is that it wasn't just, uh, and I'm not saying this to be like C3 cute, it wasn't just that Democrats had control of the legislature. More importantly, is that it was the most progressive, most values aligned with our movement, first pro-choice majorities, first pro-climate majorities that our state has ever had. And so really focusing on the way that um, we do our, our politics in the state that puts our values, that puts our issues, that get our people into office and equip them to organize inside of government and outside of government around our issues and values was such a central piece of the of what took us to wins this year. Thank you for that. And I, I'm going to, building a little bit off, you know, I think both Carson and Leon have mentioned um, the need for there to be, to be multiple strategies here, right, which includes institution building, which includes building independent political power. Um, one thing that I think has come up in the conversation we've mentioned is, is this um, term collaborative governance. And I think people understand that on a spectrum. Um, there may be an understanding of we're collaborating with someone who's governing because we've supported their campaign and, the, and they've been elected. Um, and there's collaborative governance um, in the arena that Elian was talking about in, in terms of shaping policy, right? Like how are we ensuring that the policy that's being passed is also being implemented um, by the people um, that built the power to help, help pass it? And so that brings me to Faduma because you're working on a project with folks in Washington where you're building a very localized for the state kind of framework and understanding of, of collaborative governance among stakeholders there. And so would love to turn to you now um, and, and have you kind of share um, what it is that you are, are, are building in Washington. Of course, and thank you for having me. It's lovely to be part of this discussion both to share and learn about community-driven efforts to own their own destiny and work towards shaping culture on systems of collaborative governance in their districts, cities, and states. Um, People's Economy Lab as an organization and our work in Washington State is anchored in the Just Transition Framework, which is a set of principles, processes, and practices that built economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a more living and regenerative economy, both for our labor and our, you know, our the resources that we extract from um, our lived environment. So in 2021, sort of coming out of a you know full year of experience with COVID, and building upon other streams of work such as the poverty reduction work group, which a partner organization, the statewide poverty action network facilitates. 
it's a group consisting of agency leaders, and we're talking about state agency, um, advocacy groups, community members with lived experience of poverty, work to develop a 10-year economic strategic plan for the state um, to reduce poverty and improve community outcomes. And also work being done by Front and Center, which is an organization that worked to, as, to advance equitable environmental and climate justice policies and strategies for building a new economy in Washington. And what does the path forward look like? And what is the role for community in that space? So coming off you know, the wake of COVID and the recovery, disproportionately benefiting certain communities more than others, it sort of became very, very evident that we should think about representation in decision-making spaces and who's deciding the allocation of resources and how much of it goes where. Obviously, uh, you know, as Eliana discussed, you know, the political sphere and then the electrical, the uh, elections um, can do so much. Um, but one of the strategies in the state's economic plan is to make equal space for power and influence of people and communities who are disproportionately affected by poverty and inequality in decision making spaces. And towards in this endeavor, um, our project called the Justice Features Project sought to create space for leadership and participation of communities who are most impacted and historically excluded in setting the vision and measures towards a just and equitable economy in the state. And so we want to pursue policies that build and maintain an inclusionary economy where people most impacted are central to decision making and not all the decisions, simply the decisions that affect their daily lives. Um, and we want, um, and we did establish um, a co governance framework um, that lays out an ecosystem of work, uh, which requires community organizations and government agencies to partner with one another and pursue economic policies that are equitable for all. Um, and collaborative governance for us, even though we, you know, there are, there's participatory processes, there's participatory participatory democracy, deliberative democracy. You know, we're not saying that one is better than the other, but these are processes that talk about coming together and deciding together and moving forward together and implementing and carrying the challenges together. So for us, collaborative governance is about rethinking what power can look like and overcoming barriers to co-creation between community organizations and government agencies. Um, one of the strategies um, has been to call into question the role of community in power spaces, in decision-making spaces, and to create meaningful and significant seat at the table to influence policy and programmatic priorities that affect their daily lives. So we're calling for a culture and system shift and to position communities as policy designers. Uh, we are advocating for collaborative processes and tools such as community assemblies and parts of the budgeting. Um, our city of Seattle is now in the process of a $30 million parts of the budgeting, and we're looking forward to see what we learn from there. Um, and we want spaces that are intentionally co convened and inclusive of people as well as ideas. Um, this framework also calls for the co commitment to self-determination of communities. Um, cultivating community capacity and expertise so that we can show up in meaningful ways to partake in these important decisions, um, to develop and co-create equitable processes that facilitate collaboration and co-creation. Um, and as ultimately shared governing power, you know, we can call it collaborative governance or shared governing power, but ultimately are we at the seat together at the table and are we making decisions together? And so, and I want to end it with this, um, that control of resources and decision making should be decolonized. Um, otherwise, we shall stagnate and deepen the disparities for generations to come. Thank you for that. And Tarsen, uh, I saw that you were gone for, for a minute and my heart dropped. I was like, no, um, glad to have you back. Um, we'll, we'll jump right to you in, in case the storm comes back and we, we lose you again um for for a little bit hopefully that doesn't happen um but you mentioned you know earlier that you you believe strongly that process is designed to change governing institutions and government it, it must come it must come from the people right it has to be driven from outside of these institutions that that the locus of power has to come from outside um in order to change 
Um, and you mentioned um, a few processes in Brazil um, that were driven um, originally um, by movements, um, participatory budgeting um, being one of them. Can you kind of discuss, you know, what comes next? Not not to say look at your crystal ball, but as you reflect on the past and think about the future, um, what comes next um, for movements there? What what are what are folks driving towards in order to create governing power that it, that's more distributive um, and and pulls people out from the margins um, into decision making? positions yes uh well just uh just to say that i i my internet went down because we have a huge storm here and this has to be with the climate change uh, last week like 40, 40 49 people died on a flood so we are on the middle of a very huge climate problem here but i think that uh taking back to the com this combination between uh, direct action and institutional action. Uh, I think that what we have uh, next uh, here is that uh, we are now again on a good moment. We just elected Lula uh, as president and he has a strong com commitment, not only with democracy, but also with the social movements. And now we are now on a process of uh, trying to implement nationwide uh, participatory democracy processes. Uh, we started by uh, making the multi-year plan of the government for the plan for the next five year, uh, next four years of the federal government, and it was all discussed uh, uh, directly by the population. And we used, and I think this is the new part, we used uh, IT technologies to uh, widen participation. This process of discussing the multi-year plan of the federal government was not only done by uh, direct participation in popular assemblies in all the states, but also in an internet platform where people could vote for the priorities of the government and also uh, use it uh, to, uh, people can propose uh, initiatives that uh, can be voted by everyone. And we have like, 1,006,000 uh, people on this process. So I think that we are now on the moment. Uh, and I think that the most important thing is that we must have strong movements outside the state, pressuring, pressuring from outside, but also we need to build political will to change the institutions and build more participatory institutions. It's not an easy path to go. It's not a simple thing to do. And it's very challenging in political terms because the power holders never like to share their power with the people. But I think that uh, the most important thing is that we must uh, recognize or we must uh, consider the idea of the people trying to, and this has to be with the, what the colleagues was, was, were talking about, uh, co-governance or uh, or people's governance uh, and think and I think that this uh, here in Porto Alegre we experienced a very interesting process on the first 10 12 years of participatory budgeting but I think that it's always important to take uh, in uh, to to be aware that you can build or can design participatory institutions but if they are not uh, animated by the pressure and the, and the strength of the social movements, these can of be hollow, empty spaces because the combination of the, these two dimensions, direct action and institutional participation is the most important uh, aspect of all these processes. Uh, when the movements got weaker, these spaces started to be uh, useless or or empty so i think that organizing uh, being able to influence the political agenda building alliance making pressure by all means is the recipe to a, a, a good result i think that the most important things is that the movement has to build its own goals and these goals must never be uh, 
encapsulated in the current institutional framework. We have always to think ahead, think beyond our reality of the moment, and never, never uh, be content with uh, democracy is something that you can build forever and you can always be more democratic. So the key thing, I guess, uh, for, the for the movements is that we must, uh, our strength is related to the capacity that we have to involve everyone. So we must learn to be inclusive to be democratic and to uh, leave the democracy inside the movements as well. The only way to build people power is to be democratic in all our relations. It's not only uh, demanding more democracy for the gov by the government, but also building democracy in our everyday relationships, being more whole more democratic, having voice for everyone. So this is a way to build people power. I want to you I want to pick up on something you, you talked about. Um, well, one, you talked about the ca capacities that we need to build. Um, and you also said about, um, you know, this not being a simple thing to do, which brought me back and Leon to something that you mentioned earlier, which is all the different spaces where y'all are contesting for governing power, right? Like you, you talked about the electoral arena, um, you talked about the administrative arena, um, you know, we talked about strategies, you know, direct action. Um, it's not a simple thing to do for community organizations to contest for power in multiple different arenas. And so it, my question for you, Elian, is like, as you reflect back, how are, how is Take to Action Minnesota and partners and allies in Minnesota building um the capacity in order to contest for power in all these different arenas? Great question, Casey. We're trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> you know, I, the the phrase implementation crisis is thrown around a lot right now in Minnesota. We won a lot. Um, we, and, and now we got, like now the real work begins. Like we have to make these laws real. We have to implement them. We have to build new agencies and build new regulations and staff hundreds of thousands of people at the state. I mean, or I made this a slight over exaggeration, but like a lot of people and yeah. who are these people? Where are they coming from? Um, and I, I think this, this really, I mean, for me, one of my reflections really from the last I mean, for a long time, but particularly being here in my role in Minnesota for the past four years has been the need for our movement to focus on building governing, gov like governing infrastructure, governing capacity. Um, Sarah Johnson and I, Sarah Johnson's the outgoing executive director of Local Progress. She and I wrote, we sort of co-edited a forge um, um edition around governance, co-governance. And she, I will never forget, she started to start grounded our early conversations on like, you know, the go around in movement spaces, the opening question of like, when we've won it all, you know, what will you be doing? And everyone's like, you know, on a beach, drinking from a coconut, like living in, you know, off the grid, farming, you know, and she was like, no, we have to all be bureaucrats. We have to govern. We have to actually make the things work. And I that sticks with me a lot because I sort of want it both. You know, I, I I want my cake and eat it too, which I believe we can have. But I, I think that what that speaks to me is like, yeah, I mean, we are struggling to win so that more becomes possible, that our lives are improved. And I think like Tarson just said, if we don't continue to build the social movement infrastructure and the outside pressure and contesting in our workplaces and the economy, our gains at, in with the state rapidly erode and um, and we cannot sustain them and hold them. We learned that lesson very painfully actually in our organizing in Minneapolis around this mass movement and major gains emerged and then movements lack of infrastructure to support the governing um, mo moment that we were then in to realize the pledges from elected officials and the the transformation we we're going to make around public safety in the city of Minneapolis 
rapidly eroded to the organized forces that we were up against, both moderate neoliberal forces, police forces, and corporate forces. And so that's the other element of what we're up against in the state, in addition to building the governing infrastructure we need, like who are our bureaucrats? How are we gonna staff this? Who are we putting in there in a strategic way? So it's not also like a brain drain from our organizations, which are already strapped for finding you know, staff. I mean, it's a real struggle. We don't have an answer. I can tell you all the challenges. We're trying to figure out the solutions right now um, and are taking all advice. But the other thing that we really are also clear on is, yes, we have won a lot. Um, and it matters and it's important and it is not enough. You know, I talked, spoke earlier about earned sick and safe time. So it's paid, so we call paid sick days in Minnesota, really important. And we're on that thing for 10 years. And I am like both so happy we passed it. And also like, that is like not enough, <laughs> you know? I mean, that is just like insufficient for what we are up against. And so, you know, really looking at what, are the biggest, boldest demands we need to be moving. And what we've seen in the state is that when those demands come up against the pocketbooks of the rich and corporations, we don't have the power to win. You know, the real economic issues, we don't have the power to win. And the only bills the governor vetoed was one around um, nurses and safe, safe, safe staffing that the healthcare industry threatened to like pull, Mayo Clinic threatened to like pull out a bunch of development money from our state and, and rideshare workers who work for Uber and Lyft, those two bills got vetoed by the governor because those major corporations are putting a lot of pressure and they're continuing to put a lot of pressure in, in Minneapolis. And we know when we do a, a, a corporate, a scan of the corporate money in the state, we're drowning in it. And the, the thing I'll say about that money, when you look at it really sharply, oftentimes we look at it and we think about the, mon the corporate money in elections. When we look in Minnesota, the corporate money far outpaces movement or people's money around lobbying. And especially, especially the people inside of the implementation and rulemaking infrastructure. And so, you know, we really, like we are up against really major organized infrastructure. And so we have to build the capacity to be smart, strategic, have a tight power analysis, have good research, understand who is operating where with what money and what influence they have, find the pressure points. And frankly, at this point, we don't have the capacity to be everywhere. So make you know decisions about where we can be the most impactful, the most strategic, continue to build, to contest with that major corporate power operating in our state. And then continue to build our capacity to govern with leadership development and organizing and getting more and more of our people ready to build and contest for power both inside the state as well as outside the state. Yeah, the challenge is we could probably have a whole webinar to just talk about the challenges around capacity. Um, but I, I want to, um, Faduma, I, I want to turn to you um and we in the chat in case folks are not listening we're about to open it i'm sorry in, folk, in case folks are not following the chat because we are listening um we are going to open it up um for audience questions um very shortly but for duma i wanted to turn to you um one of um the north stars for people's economy lab is to grow a restorative economy in washington state um my question for you is what does a restorative economy look like um, for Washington? Uh, and what and how is this framework that you're building there um, around collaborative governance a, a key strategy to, to get you there? Yeah, so here in Washington, um, community-based organizations, and that's who we work with, as well as state agencies, um, city agencies, as well as county, um, specifically community-based organizations are working diligently to mitigate challenges and barriers um, in terms of access to programs and services for their communities, um, advocating for policies, influencing political agenda, and finding creative ways to tap into resources. Another layer to the work is looking at the structures and processes which this work flows through. Those structures and processes are not equitable themselves. Thus, often there's little to no surprise as to why gaps in opportunity exist for marginalized communities. 
we want to share and socialize the just transition framework and what is an extractive versus a regenerative economy. It helps to demystify the economy as a concept and instrument and allows us to recognize it as an expression of our values and behaviors. Uh, most of us really don't think about the economy in our daily lives. We are familiar with its terminology, such as inflation, recession, taxes. But are we really familiar with opportunity cost, comparative advantages, you know, fiscal policy and how it works? Um, so we must ground our, our understanding of the economy in our communities and in our work and our role and contribution to its continued existence. So one thing we have to be clear about is that just transition doesn't happen on its own, right? We are able, we should be able to define a shared purpose that's embedded in social and ecological well-being and overall better governance, like we're saying collaborative governance, which is rooted in deep participatory democracy. Um, it's also about giving power back to the people, um, which majority of the panelists have mentioned. Um, to create sustainable future tied to equitable systems, um, to look to communities most harmed by the current economy for them to define what well-being means to them. And we're not talking about, you know, access to basic needs such as housing, healthcare, employment, nutrition, and education. We want to see and we want to distinguish what it means and looks like to survive as a community as opposed to thrive as, as a whole. Um, then we want and we have to think together um, in order to create processes for frontline communities to engage and co-create within agency uh, programs and policies, spe especially those fathers that way for the economic benefits. Um, in so many ways, when we talk about the environment, often we make sacrifices between what the environment needs and what the economy needs. But, you know, the reason why our environment is so messed up is because of our economic choices, you know, how long and how depth we need to sort of dig things through and burn through resources. We don't need that profit, you know, we don't need to have billionaires, um, but we do need um, a living wage job. We do need nutritious and healthy food. We do need time off from work to focus on the nurturing that our community and environment requires. And so we're trying to be strategic as a cultural shift, as a movement, but ultimately we want to impact behaviors before we can assess and develop more equitable processes. Thank you so much um, for that. I know I have more questions, um, but I would like to open it up um, to the audience um, to see if anyone has any questions so we can pull people into this conversation and, and get some of your insight um, and thoughts from, from folks who are spending time with us in the audience. So the Q&A is open. Um, so please jump in there um, with any questions that you might have. I'll give it um, just a little bit um, before jumping back in um, for a question. Like one of the hardest things to do as a facilitator is just to give it a second, give people a minute to breathe, collect their thoughts. Wow, um, we're gonna jump in. Um, <laughs> we're gonna jump in um, with the a, a, a real a meaty question, um, for lack of a better term. Um, so, in relation to Paduma's point to reimagining how we define the economy and giving more power to the people to self determine what is needed, curious about your thoughts on what are the most difficult or direct limitations or behaviors within global capitalism and its current shape the economic dynamics around it that you see impacting those goals now? You know, I feel like Tarzan is a great respondent to this question, but one of the limitations I can highlight is I think this 
this lack of capping wealth or the accumulation of wealth, I think it comes at the at the cost of you know labor and how we exploit labor and who should work and how long they should work, but also the extensive sort of um, I would say transgression around sort of our natural resources and how we choose to take them. We sacrifice natural resources um, that contribute to oxygen development. And so that's an area where I feel like capitalism as a theory, as in a practice, really doesn't um, gatekeep to the limits and the dimensions of wealth and the pursuit of it specifically. Tarsin, did you want to... Share some thoughts on that, or Elian? I think that it's it's really a complicated question, but I think that uh, maybe the the key for building a strategy is how to combine our utopian views and what we want to be the what the world what we, what we want the, the world to be with a pragmatic approach on what are the steps necessary to build this different reality. I think that when we uh, started the World Social Forum here in Porto Alegre, we, uh, we used this motto, uh, another world is possible. I think that the idea is that we don't have to wait for a big political transformation to start to, to build different relations. This is something that you might do on a daily basis, you have to transform your reality in order to transform the bigger, uh, the bigger uh, societal framework. And uh, what I uh, I take from all of these is that, as uh, Carol Pateman uh, stated in the eighties, uh, participation is a learning process. The only way that we we will be able to uh, govern the world or to, to, or to build capacities for the people to be uh, in power is by giving people a chance to participate and to learn how to exert this power. So I think that uh, that's why I think that social movements are so important because we must learn and we must acquire the capabilities to, uh, to be in power uh, and this means like learning how to plan, learning how to manage the economy, learning how to uh, build political relationships. And, and you only learn it by doing it. And so that's why I was stating that uh, democracy is not only a, an institutional framework for political participation, but democracy is something that you build on your everyday relations. And the way to transform the world is by uh, having a transformative uh, action on your day-to-day -day relationship. So the movements themselves must be democratic. The movements themselves must have space for everyone. We must always try to avoid gatekeeping and, and power structure inside. Because if we reproduce inside the movements the same power, relations that we have in society you cannot transform society so i think that not only I, I always stress the need to have strong social movements to build democracy but I, I i also state that in order to build democracy you you must be democratic and that's a way to change things so uh, participatory budgeting for example was an example of participation where people learn how not only people have uh, a space to put their demands, but also people learn organizing skills, learn uh, planning skills that allowed people to change their reality beyond the city budget. People learn on the process capabilities, uh, acquire capabilities to change their day-to-day -day reality by exercising democracy on a daily basis. I wanna... And this means also democratize the economy, as Faduma is stating. You, democracy must not be uh, uh, only uh, something that you have on the political space, but also in the, the economic spaces as well. A lot of good questions coming to us, so I want to try to get to as many as we can. We won't be able to get to them all. Um, but this question is on um, picking up, 
as folks were talking about taking on um, roles as bureaucrats, um, the question is, I wonder what you all think of positioning activists, organizers within those roles with the goal of supporting institutional reformation and transformation along the way, rather than after making change happen. And so I think the, the question here is like, it, is it a strategy that you're employing um, to, to move folks from organizations, from movements into um, these more bureaucratic policy um, shaping decisions. Yeah, I think I think I see Marilyn comment both and, which I really agree with. And we can always be layers more strategic and organized. Um, and we also have to move because we're up against a lot. And you know, so I I have another vivid memory. Um, one of our members ran for office in the city of St. Paul for the city count for city council she won um and i remember her saying to me like elian i mean you get in there and, and there's like all the unspoken things but she's like you li like you literally need someone to tell you where the copying machine is you know i mean there's like really basic stuff of like once you get in these inst this infrastructure like how do you even move and operate and then in our organizing experience and i I'm 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 betting this is consistent across all of our experience is that oftentimes it's not the elected elected officials that are our problem to getting something passed it's their staff both the and, and like it's like the the staff of the infrastructure um in Minis in Minneapolis they call the city government the enterprise so I it's like such a good uh word to describe how I mean the enterprise is designed to slow things down, gum up the system, make things hard to move, maintain the status quo. And so, yeah, like we have to get our people in there and have to learn how does government work and how does it operate so that when we build more and more majority uh, power inside there, we can, we can win things and we know how to win things and the system is somewhat primed for us to be able to do it so it is really important to to like get that get that up and running and moving and um and you need to be intentional about how to do that the other thing that i think is really important uh i was like if i ever get elected to any our executive office i'm not running for office but if i ever did all i would do in like the most like progressive radical left way is restructure government because it's designed to not work. And so as we're trying to move things and make things happen, we like just come up against the system and there's no amount of good people you can put in these really broken, racist, imperialist, capitalist systems to make them work better. We do literally need to restructure them. And that's a massive undertaking that I don't believe movement has a deep grounding in. Of like, what departments should we create? What's the staffing structure for them? How do you create the budget for them? What's the accountability mechanism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so building our movement's capacity to govern um, is critical. And it can't be it because I, you know, as like Tarson keeps reminding us, we need social movements. And it's, you know, there's like a danger uh, you know, I, I believe there's a danger to advancing, you know, community control and participatory practices and processes without a robust social movement to hold them accountable and to animate them. Because if we don't have that to, to accompany it, those systems, in my experience, reinforce the status quo and provide actually like community cover for the worst actors. And so, um, you know, just we, I think it's really important that we sharpen our assessment, our depth of understanding, our intentionality, and our thoughtfulness. Because um, as we are moving change, un unfortunately, the other side is much more organized, much more ready, and they see what's coming, and they've already get mapped out a couple ways for them to keep on winning, even as we feel like we're winning. Um, which is one of the big problems with global capitalism is. Capital has no borders, you know? And so they're moving and operating in many terrains and many arenas and playing us off each other um, very strategically and very intentionally in big and small ways. This, um, I wanna to touch back on something I feel like has come up a few times. And Elian, you, you talked about the need to restructure government and Tarsen, early in the conversation, you talked about in Brazil um, that folks recognized they needed to build institutions outside of government that would help shape how um, 
shape government, shape government in Brazil. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Tarsen? When you talk about that you all made the strategic decision to build institutions that would help shape governing, what what does that look like, um, and what has that looked like? Yes, I think that uh, one of the important things is like, uh, and I'm. I never thought systematically about it, but uh, it's something that we, what we did was trying to reshape uh, the institutions of the state, opening more spaces for civil society to jump in and have a say. So uh, the councils that I mentioned are uh, part of the state, but are councils that civil society organizations and social movements have representation to discuss particular issues like a council that uh, that discusses all the health system of Brazil which is public and very interesting and and, and all this uh, public health system national nationwide public health system is governed by a council that two-thirds is civil society and one-third is the government so it's, it's kind of a structure that is partly state partly civil society sometimes it works sometimes it's not some in some cases it's better and so in, in other cases uh, it's it doesn't work well but it's i think that uh, michael menser from brooklyn college has a really interesting book on uh, on theories of uh, democratic participation and he says that we have uh, to try to dismantle the state like uh, 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 try to uh, to open spaces and try to change the, the very nature of the state, opening more spaces for participation. So building new institutions where the public can have more power inside, because the state is not a monolith that you conquer when you occupy the palace. The state is a multiplicity of different institutions, and you must be trying to occupy every one of these spaces that are opened and try to force uh, the mo social movements into that and try to open more and more spaces inside the state. Like, uh, so it's, it's, it's complicated. I think that Eliane was, uh, was mentioning some of the most uh, uh, complicated parts of it is that when you go into the state, you try, you, you tend to be co-opted and captured by all the bureaucracies and regulations and what you can do and what you cannot do. And, and, and this is very complicated. So uh, we must get into the state, open more spaces, but at the same time, we must be aware that you cannot be captured by this kinds of structure. And always try to establish the rules of the game in a more democratic way possible criteria of participation, who participated, how it works, trying to always have a very uh, open space and, and, and very democratically established rules of participation. And I think that one of the most complicated things is that uh, I was reading a book of Inigo Errejón, which is one of the leaders of the Indignados in Spain and part of uh, building of Podemos. And he was saying that uh, the more, more, more ethical part of participation, like social movements, occupations, the mo moments that everybody is uh, involved and in participating are more ethical and more transformational. But the real problem is that when things go down and things calm down, how to keep the transformation going when the, when the, when the pressure of the movement is not present? How to organize the next day? how to make sure that after the revolution, this, the, the trash will still be collected. All the day-to-day -day things that are as important as the most transformational mo moments. And, and, we, uh, and, and I think that in this case, the only way to learn is by doing the things. Doing and making the mistakes and learning from the mistakes and trying to do it again, thinking about what it what went wrong and and always try to collectively have a reflection on the process in a way to avoid cooptation and keep the idea of a, a, a more radical transformation as your 
utopian goal. I really like uh, the concept that uh, uh, was the guy who talked about. There was a, a sociologist in the U.S. that had the pro, uh, real utopia projects. Uh, I don't remember his name, but uh, this idea of being utopian and being pragmatic at the same time, like wanting, uh, always looking further and beyond the limits of the system, but always uh, trying to do it step by step and stepping firmly, like the Chinese say, you cross the river by stepping one stone at a time, like building our utopia on if one of the steps that you are done on a daily basis. Faduma, just um, any reflections or, or response to anything you just heard? Well, I, I do want to endorse what Tarzan and Eliane have said. Um, and they are, they, because majority of the projects um, on the projects we deal with have to do with working with government agencies, um, we take the route of building relationships, you know, understanding that, you know, ultimately outside of our systems, you you leave your job, you leave your job and go out to the community, you live among community members. And so we're not, you know, the other side isn't, you know, operated by, you know, AI machines thus far, or like aliens who, who don't know how to sort of communicate with us. But th these are real people. And often, you know, there is some massaging and conversations and relationship building and say, hey, let's have coffee. Um, there's a quote that I like of MLK, which he says, you know, those who love war must organize as effectively as those who love peace. Yeah. And so we, you know, in, on this side of the movement, I think we need we need some diligence. We need some sort of, roles and you know um and scopes of work that all work in cohesion together similar to the structures that government has because they these are sort of elaborate power is elaborate and we have to be very technical and honestly the devil is in the detail so i do agree with tarson about setting the rules of the game you know outside of the game that's happening right now and thinking about you know what criteria we want to implement but those processes require technical expertise they require a depth of knowledge on the landscape and even it requires understanding you know not just the pockets where power lies but rather which of those pockets can be influenced that trigger or chain reaction to other pocket pockets because you can't be everywhere and these systems uh, are honestly more sometimes have existed longer than us um, and so building sort of a safe space outside, but that also understands how to get in and interact and, you know, take what it needs and also co-opt on the others, you know, the co-option from our corner to that system. And so we leave and learn, um, but ultimately I do agree that we need sort of a culture, a cultural practice in this sense. Um, activists for me are like, assassins you know on our side you know that can be sent and sort of carry on very you know technical and sometimes it's, you have to be loud you know silence you know isn't what's needed so we need a lot of tools in our sort of toolkit and I'm glad that folks are thinking about you know what those tools can look like and who would want to take ownership of that so I invite the listeners to think about you know what is your positioning and sort of, and what's your contribution um, and investments into the movement? Even if you don't want to, or you don't have time to play an active role, that's fine. We we do need supporters. We need folks who would give inputs and and even thread the needle. And so, if you know of you know information and and spaces and people we can learn from, please feel free to share, and we would share what we know as well. Tarson, you mentioned you know this this is been a conversation around strategy, I think, grounded in optimism and hope. Um, but, you know, Tarson, you mentioned a storm, right, in which people lost their life um, in Puerto Regle recently. And here in the U.S., I mean, this summer has been um, devastating. Um, you know, climate change has been devastating here in the U.S. And um, I want to kind of close this out. Um, you know, there's another word that we haven't used, the the A word, authoritarianism at all, um, right? Um, which 
you know, Elian, there are states around you all in which governors are, are ruling with ever expanding authoritarian strategies and similar, you know, Tarsen in the global south, um, you know, it's maintaining a deep um, foothold. Um, and, you know, they're also organizing in, in their way they do using capital and corporate power and other strategies to, to capture governing power. Um, and, you know, we could have a whole other um, webinar just talking about that. Um, but I, I actually want to close out within, you know, um, all of those kind of obstacles and challenges and, and facing all of that. Um, what's giving you hope right now? Um, you know, as, as we close this conversation, um, you know, what's, what's giving you hope? What's giving you hope that we're going to overcome um, what can feel like intractable challenges that we're going to build the coalitions internationally, um, locally, and nationally necessary um, to build governing power. So I'll start um, with you, uh, Tarsin, and then we'll go to Faduma and, and Elian. Well, uh, I think that one of the important things that we have to have in mind uh, is that uh, there's a lot of talk about the crisis of democracy in the whole world, uh, which really is a reality. But I think that maybe we can change a little our framing of this question, because I don't think that is a crisis of democracy. There is a crisis of elector, uh, elected governments and representative democracies in crisis. But every, every time you open spaces to the people to participate and to have a voice, people come. People really like to participate. People really like, most of people really like democracy better than authoritarianism. The question is that the system, the, our uh, democratic uh, system is not totally democratic. It's only electoral democracy, which is not enough to change the things the way they are. So what gives me hope is that there are all around the world many different, very interesting uh, initiatives where people is doing transformational things everywhere. We have participatory budgeting in China. We have all the climate uh, movement everywhere. I, I, I really, uh, I have the tenants movements in the U.S., the peasants movements in Brazil and over Latin America. So there is a really a real interest for the ordinary citizens by the ordinary citizens for democracy and people really like democracy so i think that this gives me hope and the other thing is that uh, on the other side we are facing a major climate crisis and everybody can understand that so i think that the 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 struggle for survival of humanity, the ecologist approach is something that can be a, a glue that merges all these movements together. I think that everyone understands that if we don't change our economic system, the humanity as a whole is a threat. So I think that maybe this emergency can sensibilize everyone and i think that if the movements connect to this uh, ecology environmental approach is a good way to uh, to like gather everyone around a transformational project for our society in the international level Paduma? yes um i mean tarzan encapsulated uh, many wonderful points and the caveat i would add is you know, we are we are not speaking to something completely profound and new. These are indigenous practices from all over the world that have um, had collaborative practices, and we only need to look back and deepen, you know, and retrieve those learnings and retrieve those practices. And because democracy invaded a lot of communities and co-opted their own processes, and so. Um, the idea that it can also it doesn't look the same, right? Democracy on the African continent looks very different than democracy in the West and also in the global south. And so we have to be mindful that ways, indigenous ways are also as diverse and they can look differently for communities. It will depend on the values, the priorities, and ultimately the resources 
and assets at play that don't, you know, negatively impact the environment. Um, you know, you can have a discussion about the economy without having a discussion about the environment and vice versa. Um, it's a it's a central, you know, agent. And so what I would like to see more, and I think I'm happy about sort of the kind of discussions we're having is that folks are having discussions about this. For, folks are asking the right questions. And there is a sense of optimism in the world nowadays, you know, because I'm an immigrant and I have families scattered all over the world. And so I know that these conversations are happening elsewhere. Um, but we also have to be mindful that, you know, government is a collection of humans, you know, that can be dismantled just the way other systems have been dismantled. So sort of bringing down that perception and understanding that systems itself is not this elusive thing but rather there are people behind those walls, behind those ivory towers. And it's a matter of getting to the human level um, and then bringing that back to that central agent of, you know, do we align on our shared purpose? Do we understand how we want to, you know, delegate our resources, share our resources, and ultimately think about the sustainability of, you know, not just the human race, but the planet we occupy. And clearly the only planet we can thus far exist without having to be equipped with, you know, technology as a, as a breathing resource. But um, it's one of those things that even at the community CPO level, the grassroots level, I think we can, you know, there's a lot of, you know, literature that can help, but also experiences of having to ask, you know, Elena, how are you doing and how are you mobilizing in Minneapolis? Uh, how is TARS are mobilizing in Brazil and whether those lessons are can provide key ingredients for what we're doing here in Washington? Yeah, I was thinking a lot about hope and the practice of hope um, and this and this summer, Casey, uh, right before you were um, setting this question up. And the summer has been really hard. And this last year's have been really hard and where I find hope and I get grounded you know, I'm an organizer, is in the people. We had a, a members across greater Minnesota, which is the Minnesota word for rural Minnesota, greater Minnesota, and that were um, at the center of the fight, the CRT fight, which is at its core an authoritarian white Christian nationalist fight that they're using CRT and now trans kids and trans rights as the vehicle to move their agenda forward. And moms and women across the state of Minnesota saw that emerging in their small towns and stood up against it um, to, to struggle for better schools and a better, safer, more welcoming community for their children. And they ran for school board and they organized at their school board um, meetings. And honestly, it was some of the most politically violent um, spaces I've ever seen in my organizing career to the point where one of our leaders had a car run into her home for her public organizing. But she moved forward and she maintained and her crew of allies ran for office and they all lost except for one. And they're all planning to run again. And the one who won immediately the next day, they made a safety plan for her to never be alone at a school board meeting to always have someone walk her to her car. That's how we build. And that's how we stand up against the evil forces coming our way, not just to stop them, but actually to build something better for our children and our children's children and the children who come after them. And that's what gives me hope. And I believe in that small step, those small experiences of courageous people stepping up and saying, I demand something better for my family and for my community. And I'm not going to give up. And I'm not going to be scared. And I'm not going to let you silence me. That's really powerful and moving. And it's where I find so much hope and so much courage about our future. And this last weekend, I went up ricing with my family, my mother and my daughter and my partner. It's rice, it's wild rice harvesting season for folks who are not tracking that. Y'all should come and, and, and do some ricing. It is a beautiful ritual and it's a beautiful way to feed yourself and your family. And one of the things that we did um, was we made seed bombs. We took wild rice that we just seeds that we just harvested and put them into clay balls. And my family and I brought a bag home and we're going to seed a lake 
that has lost its wild rice. And we are going to put those seeds in the lake and we are going to hope and pray and wish that they take and that we have wild rice there next season. And if it's there, we'll put more seeds. And if it's not there, we'll put more seeds anyway, because that practice also gives me hope of planting seeds and nurturing those seeds. And some of them burst into new life and some of them don't, but like, that's how we, we re-rice our waters um, in the both literal and figurative way um, that we are all trying to do in our work and in our organizing and, and in our building for a better future. Planting seeds, I feel like that might be the most apt metaphor um, to take us out um, of this conversation. I want to show deep, deep appreciation and gratitude to everyone who joined us um, in the audience. Um, for more information about their work, um, again, Elion is at Take Action Minnesota. You can find them online. Um, if you're in Minnesota, um, think of ways to support them. If you're not in Minnesota, think of ways um, to support them. Um, Faduma is at People's Economy Lab. Um, you can also find them online. You can find their work online. Um, think of ways to support um, their work. Tarson is at the... Observatory of the Metropolis um, in Puerto Alegre. Um, please um, think of ways to support their work, learn about their work. Um, you know, it's deeply important that we're in conversation um, and, and community. Um, and we hope to continue to facilitate these conversations for a conversation around governing power for sovereignty. On our website, um, we have a podcast, The Next World, where we're in conversation with Judith LeBlanc and Native Organizers Alliance um, that are speaking about um, what governing power means for a sovereign um, nation on, on this land. And so um, the conversations are happening in, in multiple spaces. Thank you again so much for everyone who joined us, um, for everyone who registered, we'll, we will send out this webinar, um, a recording. Please support the folks um, and their organizations. Look for any way to um, support and we would love to be in touch with everyone moving forward.